formative influence. Even the points in which the filmmakers depart from the substance and character of the philosopher's work, and they do actually do that quite often. Elul's overarching vision of modernity and its problems is still fundamental to their project. So I want, what I want to do briefly in this evening is to talk about the Coxie films, what they have to say, how they say it, and how that relates to some specific and general themes in El Lul's thought. This leads to the beginning sequences of the first movie, Koyana Skatsi, which means life out of balance or crazy life. Or way of life. And Reggio explains that his work is inspired in part by visions of Katsi found in Hopi prophecies. So what you see here is the opening segment uh, from Koyana Skatsi, Life Out of Balance. Um, as we are having the, the discussions today at, at the uh, various talks, um, I noted all kinds of places in which uh, these films would be highly problematic from an Alulian point of view. But one of them David has already mentioned, namely Reggio's intention to use visual imagery with music and just occasional sound effects, totally without script, totally without actors, uh, no narrative, explicit narrative of the kind you find in conventional documentaries, uh, using just images and sound to produce a series of lasting impressions that ask us to reflect upon what we are seeing and hearing. So we heard today about the humiliation of the word and the rise of the image. That's what these films are, in some sense, all about. As a young man, uh, Godfrey Reggio lived in a religious order whose method of devotion, by his account, required total silence. So his method of avoiding words, of avoiding verbal explanations in documentary film mode, uh, makes perfect sense within a mood of philosophical reflection, which these films certainly seek to uh, inspire. Uh, Reggio wants his viewers to ask, what are we seeing here? What does it mean? What are the connections between the various moments and episodes? Uh, of course, there is a language or perhaps a, a grammar of sorts evident in the film. The images and impressions that directly and forcefully present themselves, along with what amount to provocations or even lessons that emerge from one's experience of watching the film. Uh, in this work, Reggio was uh, quite lucky to have found collaborators who were willing and able to help him realize his vision. By the way, from the very first time I talked to him, there were always three films. He had the names for them, he had the plans for them. Especially prominent in the first and only the first movie was Ron Fricke, a technically brilliant cinematographer and visionary in his own right. He went on to do a movie, Baraka, for example. Fricke's most obvious contributions in Koyana Skatsi include the use of stunning, highly original use of time-lapse photography, and the use of sweeping cinematic vistas um, that seem to evoke the essence of things in both nature and in the artificial uh, landscapes of the city and the, te the technosphere. So notable in his work, let me move this up a bit, are contrasting scenes of clouds and water,
liquidity of the mist, the clouds, <coughs> set against scenes of arid deserts, the South American Southwest, the mountains. And what we see here is a world that exists before the modifications and alterations brought by modern industrial society and its various technological devices. Uh, that is a significant for a basic theme in the three movies because it suggests a mode of being, a highly integrated mode of being that eventually came to be targeted and transformed, incorporated into the technological societies of the modern era. And as we'll see a little bit later, Reggio and Fricky employed these same cinematic techniques, which by the way, the time this first film came out, these were truly state of the art and quite uh, remarkable and revolutionary at the time. Nobody had quite seen stuff like this in the early 1980s. Now it's uh, just going with the round, okay? But they used the same cinematic techniques to um, reveal the dynamism and problematic character of the uh, technosphere. Uh, there's a moment in the movie that serves as a boundary between um, these lush portrayals of nature and what is to come uh, in the uh, segments ahead. Let me move ahead to this segment here. About, after about 20 moments of pristine nature, So what we're going to see here should be pretty obvious. when the film is essentially already finished. Um, at the time, I had seen a, a full rough cut of the movie. Uh, Godfrey brought it by the house. He had pieces of electronic music from composers like Tomita, Terry Riley, and so forth. And he said to me, I'm also considering Philip Glass. What do you think of his work? And I replied that Glass was emerging. This was the late 1970s, emerging as a prominent figure in American music, and for that reason I thought it would probably be very difficult to get him involved. And Godfrey said, well, he's seen the clips, and he likes the basic ideas that I'm working with. And there, uh, thereupon actually began in subsequent weeks a lasting partnership covering all three films for more than two decades, and in fact, in the second and third films, they truly had a working collaboration 
that included uh, uh, cinematography and, and music. Um, here's one notable clip that um, portrays the modern city uh, as a single living whole. Move this up here. possible to recognize an essential connection between the two artists beyond this particular substance of the Katsi films. Many of Philip Glass's minimalist compositions and performances with his ensemble are explorations of musical patterns and their gradual development. His early pieces often introduce a, 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 a brief little figure and then they repeat it and gradually change it and so forth. Uh, the, the musical themes become differentiated. And as uh, Philip Glass's work matured, his signature method, of course, was using often very rapid arpeggios and letting them uh, spin around. So one, I think, can say that Reggio's attempt to represent the underlying structures and dynamics of what Elul called La Technique um, the structures and dynamics that transcend the needs and intentions of particular human subjects or social groups. That found intellectual and spiritual kinship with Philip Glass.